If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in two places. Matthew chapter 9, mark that, and then we're also going to be in Ezekiel 37 today. And um, late last night, Pastor John called me. He was a triumphant trooper, and he was trying to be here this morning, but he just, his sickness, uh, flu, whatever he's going through, just overtook him. So uh, he called me late last night. And I said, we'll tag in. And I'm reminded of when Paul said to Timothy, be ready in season and out of season. He meant that uh, literally. So um, tonight or this morning, I want to just give you something that I think the Lord had put on my mind. As we are evangelizing in our community, we're evangelizing our homes. Some of the struggles that we might go through, um, I believe that God gave a, a, a message for us of hope this morning. Like the song says, He's mighty to save. And we have to realize that in our lives. And in every scripture in the Bible, it has a place in the past, the present, and the future. And its purpose, though, is to point us, even in the Old Testament, to our need for Jesus and our participation in the gospel message itself today. And ultimately, what's it do? It points to God the Father, to His glory of who He is. In Ezekiel, the physical ramifications of this chapter is it was a prophecy that we have actually seen. Some of you are sitting here this morning have probably seen, as old as you are, the actual fulfillment of this prophecy. Easy. I have not. I would actually like to be in your shoes because I would have rejoiced if I'd have been alive at this time because we saw this happen in 1948 on May 14th. The country, the nation of Israel became a nation again after 2,000 years of being scattered and not having a homeland. This prophecy is fulfilled. But this morning I want to look at this in a different aspect or a different light. I want to par parallel Ezekiel's vision to the way that Jesus was encouraging his disciples when he was talking about the Lord of the harvest. And the theme would be here, as humans, we often get distracted very easily. We end up missing sometimes where we're going, or we become so distracted, we actually don't complete the task that's at hand. And I was thinking about this uh, in the late 1980s. I was in elementary school, so that tells you how old I am. Um, but my dad had this pride and joy Plymouth station wagon. You remember the old paneled ones? Well, when I was in elementary school, it was pretty cool. In high school, it wasn't. But I remember in Kentucky. Now, Kentucky has a strange phenomenon that causes heat. It's called the sun. And it can go from 95 degrees to 105 degrees in an hour. But I remember just driving down the freeway. Oftentimes, Dad was a pastor who would have to travel back and forth to different churches. And I remember he would always entertain us because we didn't have iPads and Game Boys and those things. The parents were the entertainment for the kids. And that's just how it was in the car. We actually had to have conversation with each other. So I remember sitting in the back seat, and I was looking way out about a quarter mile in front of us. And I remember the, the heat hitting the pavement. And I remember seeing... Everybody seen those mirages on the interstate that look like water? And they're about a quarter mile, half a mile ahead of you? Now, we all know there's no water there, okay? But we see it. Well, Dad got involved in this game. He says, you guys see that too? Yeah, let's race to it and see if it's actually there. So we began traveling down the road, and we would get there. And right where the water should have been, it automatically what? Disappears. It's no longer there. But then it's automatically replaced with what? Another mirage another quarter to half mile down the road. So we're playing this game of follow the mirage. Well, poor dad got too involved in it, and he looked up in one moment and realized he had missed his exit about five exits back because we were playing the mirage game. So this is what I'm talking about. We are easily distracted by things that we see versus things that we should be looking for. So repeat with me, if you know this verse, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So we're looking for things that are spiritual, that are not oftentimes seen by the physical eye. That is what we're called to do when we walk in our faith. In 1 Thessalonians 3.3, Paul says he wants to exhort you in your faith that no one be shaken. We need to be exhorted and encouraged to see things spiritually versus what the world is presenting to us as a mirage. 
We have to stop looking at it and follow the evidence of our faith, the unseen reality that Jesus says is there, that the Word says is there, and not be shaken from our spiritual truth. I was thinking it can often be easy to look at the world and be distracted. We get hit with thoughts. My loved ones who aren't saved, they can't be reached. You know, this divorce situation is too much. The hurt this person is going through is too heavy. You don't understand the brokenness. And all you have to do is turn on the news. It, it, it seems like times that we look at the sin and it's just too great. Is this something that we can actually overcome? And then we get discouraged. And then we have a hard time carrying on the cross. We have a hard time evangelizing. We have a hard time standing in our faith. So let's be real for a minute. Let's be honest. Who feels like that in their walk sometimes that it's just too much work? Let me see your hands. Be honest. See, look, you're not alone. We're going through this together. Sometimes it's just hard. And like Paul, I want to encourage you this morning that these thoughts, the truth of the matter is, they're the mirage. They're the things that actually have no substance. Because what I want to do is look at how God sees the situation here on earth as we're, as we're working through it, as He called us as believers. So in Matthew chapter 9, we're going to go all the way to the end. Verses 35 through 38 will be part of our study. But I want to look at verse 35 first. It says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Stop and think about this for a minute. The gospel's going out. There are miracles and healings and things happening left and right. Now, if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, I would say more than two days, this is a type of spiritual revival or awakening or fresh move that we are all praying for in America today. It's happening right here in the scripture. Yet we have verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. Even though Jesus is right there with them, working all these miracles, working everything in them, they were being scattered. They were being overcome by weariness. And we can see these people when we're ministering to one another. We can see it in our own congregation sometimes. It seems like there's no hope. So with that being said, turn to Ezekiel 37. So let's take that picture of Jesus' heart of compassion is filled for these broken people. And I want to walk us through what God is calling us to do. The mission when He says we are ambassadors for Him, that He's sending us back into the darkness, what that really means. So in Ezekiel 37... Most likely, he's probably praying at this point. In verse 1, it says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of the valley. So think about this for a second. Ezekiel was praying. Now, this would be a, this would be a great spiritual awakening. Think about it. And all of a sudden, as he lifts his eyes up in the middle of prayer. He is no longer where he was. He has been transformed to a totally different location, this vision, and he awakens. That's a spiritual movement. That's something going on in the spiritual realm. That's a testimony in itself. I would be excited. It sounds great. But finish the verse. What's it say? It was full of bones. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like a great morning devotional to wake up and see that there's just dry bones everywhere. When I, when I wake up and do my devotional, I want to wake up to folders in my cup, not bones at my feet. Verse 2, And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. So you have... Ezekiel just walking through this valley, probably kicking bones, hearing them rattle. They're at his feet. Everywhere he looks, there's death. Now, Ezekiel's not a doctor, 
But I guarantee you, He knows when we get to the stage of having bones, it's not a good thing. Life is gone. And, you know, for non-believers, they don't have to be Christians to look at the world and say, look, I look at what's going on, I look at what's happening, and I understand that it's not going to end well. So they do things like, let's save the wells. Nothing wrong with that. Let's save trees. Let's work on the ozone. Let's fight for rights. Because why? They're doing whatever they think is good to try to help this thing out. Because even they see they're not Christians, but they know the way this is going, it's not going to end well if we keep doing what we're doing. As Christians, we really do have the answer. But it's not to simply look and observe the problem. Ezekiel didn't stop here and say, yep, he's, this, these guys are dead. He didn't stop there. It's like those mechanics I knew back east. I'd pull up the truck and it, wouldn't, it wasn't working. And they popped the trunk and they go, yep, that's an engine. Yep, it ain't working. I, I know that. I need a diagnosis. I need it fixed. Well, the diagnosis has already come. God has already diagnosed the problem. That's why He sent Jesus. He gave us the solution. He's called us to be more than just someone who observes the problem. He calls us to one to be engaged with the solution. In John 17, 18, Jesus says, As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. He is now sending us into the same darkness that He sent Christ. But I think of Psalms 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear what? No evil. Why? Because He's with us. Verse 3. And He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, probably like I would, Oh Lord, you know, I, I have no idea. This, this is too much. I'm not even a doctor. I can't even, I don't even know what happened here. This is the part that we have to get. When we look around, we see death in all directions. When we see innocent lives being taken, we see families being broken. We see the homelessness situation so overwhelming. Or we see scary countries out there. We look at all this, but we can't be distracted by the death. God told us it was there. We should be looking at Him and saying, God, you know the answer. You tell me what to do here. You have the answer. I was thinking about within reach, um, I think it's about three years ago, we were working on a mobile home for a widow. And I was working with a guy that I knew really well and I trusted. And I kind of bought the, the trailer site unseen. Well, he was physically handicapped and couldn't get to the mobile home, but he had tenants. And that should have ring a bell in my mind. Um, that They exited the property. He said, here's the key. Good luck praying for you that this is exactly what you need. And I remember I stuck the key in the door and I opened it. And I almost cried. I walked in and apparently they had four very large dogs who decided to destroy every blind in the house. They destroyed the carpets in the house. I walked about two feet in and I realized I had fleas all over me. They had misused the heating element, so they destroyed the furnace, so there was no furnace. All these things. And I'm, I'm not kidding, guys. I was there for probably an hour just looking at the work that was going to have to be done, because I'm like, you know what, we'll just splash some paint, might do a couple new carpets, and then we're good. But the work ahead of me overwhelmed me in such a way that I couldn't even move. I was immobilized at the situation. And then my phone rings. It's my wife. What's it look like? <laughs> Honey, you don't want to know. You don't want to know. And she said something so profound to me. You know how to fix it. We don't have time to sit around. Let's, let's get to it. But that's what we do is we, we look at the mess and it distracts us. And yeah, three or four months later when we had it all cleaned up and ready to go, she walked in, turned the key, and she never knew the amount of cleanup that had to be done. She never, ever saw any of that. She only reaped what was done behind the scenes for her, much like the gospel. So God addresses Ezekiel here as a prophet. 
Remember, I called you to be a prophet. You know what to do. Prophesy to these bones. Tell them the word of God. Don't let death distract you. Be who I've called you to be is what Jesus is saying. Verse 4, he says, Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. That must have been an interesting conversation. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you. But they don't have any lungs. They don't have ears to hear. But he goes on to say, And you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and I will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So Ezekiel responds, So I prophesied as I was commanded, and I prophesied. There was a sound. So he's standing there. Think about this for a second. The sound was rattling. The rattling of the bones. Imagine just standing there and every bone in this vast valley was responding to the word of God. It'd be awe-inspiring but frightening all at the same time. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked and behold, there were sinews on them. This is a gruesome picture. This is what evangelism's like. They're just bones laying there. And then the tendons and the sinews and the blood vessels and all those things, that's all he's seeing right now. And then finally, and flesh came upon them. And skin had covered them. But there was no breath in them. So wait a minute. So I just prophesied. And I just watched God start to put these bodies back together. But what? They're still dead. They are still dead. And that's how we think of things sometimes. God, you asked me to do things and I did it. I loved them. I told them about you. I told everyone that I know I lived the life that I could do best of my ability. And yet they still don't believe. And then we get hit with those thoughts. My family member, my child, my coworker, that stranger. It's hard to accept when they haven't given their heart to the Lord yet. Why aren't they understanding but I thought it was interesting here. Ezekiel did not question God. Why? Because he had a full understanding that it was not about his words. It was only about what God was doing. He was the one that had the power. And the responsibility for salvation itself, that work, rests only on God. It's not even about our words. So if you're sharing the gospel and it doesn't look like anything is happening... Don't condemn yourself. Don't stop doing it because it's not about you. This is why we have these beautiful stories like in Matthew 13 where he talks about the farmer who is sowing seeds. And I understand this because he uses this gardening illustration. I don't like gardening. I am not patient enough to watch that seed grow into something. Oftentimes, I will throw it away, and then I'll go back the next week, and I'll find the trash can, and that silly thing bloomed. Because it had nothing to do with me. I could will it to grow. I could do everything in my power. But if God doesn't grow it, if that seed doesn't open up and become what it's supposed to be, it wasn't on me. So in Matthew 13, there were four different types of soils. That he talked about. I don't know if you remember them. But three of the four soils. Bared no fruit. 75% of the time. There was no fruit. Why do you think he does this? He's giving us the reality. Of the work at hand. That it is hard. But it's not impossible. In Matthew 19.26 it says. But Jesus looked at them. And said, with man, this is impossible. I want you to understand, for us to do it, it is impossible. But he doesn't leave it there. But with God, all things are possible. This is the reality that we live in. This is the faith that I'm talking about, the unseen. This is a possibility because of God. So our hope is that beautiful fourth soil that receives the gospel and it goes in and they receive salvation and they not only turn around and receive it for themselves but they go and lead others to the kingdom as well and that's just like Ezekiel here it may look even worse at times 
He's facing dead bodies laying on the ground. Wait a minute, I could handle the skeletons now. I just got a bunch of dead corpses. This is a scary scene. But if he was focused on that, instead of looking at God, he would have been distracted. So it reminds us we have to look at Jesus. We have to see the way Jesus looked at it. With man, it's impossible. But God, it's all possible. There is not one soul, and there will never be one, that has run too far, or that is too broken, or that has been destroyed by this world to such a point that the gospel cannot go in and transform them radically back alive. We have to understand that and actually believe that. That's why Paul says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. He's sitting in prison, writing this. I don't care what happens to me. I don't care about the whole nation who doesn't believe me or the king who doesn't believe me. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. There's no scale. He said anyone who will receive it and believe it, it will radically transform them. So let's see how God transforms this situation for Ezekiel in verse 9. It says, Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. Think about this for a second. There's countless bodies laying on the ground. And it says, and the breath came into them. I imagine it was all of them at one time. It was a, and you could hear it all over the valley as the breath of the Lord came into them and they lived and they stood on their feet. What a sound. What a joy it is when somebody receives Jesus for the first time. It wipes away the whole memory of everything that was destroyed and everything that was before, they're alive now. Right before Ezekiel's very eyes, God does a transformation. Ezekiel didn't do anything from total death to life, to complete life. That's why Ephesians 2 tells us we have been made alive in Christ. Not because somebody evangelized us, not somebody because of somebody's words or eloquent speech or because they were more learned or had better apologetics. It was only because Jesus reached us through somebody. He made us alive. We were all these dead bodies at one point. You remember that. And God saved us. The gospel stuck in us. We were all unbelievers at one point. But God did this miraculous work. And we have to trust God in continuing this work We've been ministering to a lady um, in Tacoma for the last nine months. And for six months of that, she was hit with the worst depression I have ever witnessed. Even Sherry and I, we continued and continued to minister and pour in the gospel. The body up there continued to pour in the gospel. And there's these moments when your flesh says, look, you've already told her this. You've already given her this truth. It's not working. But then the Holy Spirit says, keep doing it. And for the last three months, when even suicide was on the table, the last three months, it has broken off of her. When I, if I would have been distracted, or if the body would have been distracted by not doing what God has called us to do to bring the gospel, that would have never happened. But God taught us something that in our weakness, when we can't really do anything, when it is impossible for man to help, God is still doing it. God is at work when we don't even realize it. So why trust him? The end of verse 10. He made them an exceedingly great army. These broken soldiers left for dead that were forgotten. Who knows what happened to them? They were dismembered in the battle. But now God's breath itself is flowing through them. God is alive in them and they are alive in Christ. Just like the new believer. Remember that fourth soil? Matthew 13, 8. But seeds fell on good ground and they yielded a crop. Some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. I'm glad he puts that in there. 
Because we can't compare each other. We can't compare our works to each other. We're all important because of the gospel's sake. Verse 9, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear. That's what we need to be looking at as at the end result. Not at the work at hand. That distracts us. But we have to realize where God is calling us to. So turn back to Matthew chapter 9. Let's read this entirety in its context. And let's see how Jesus views the situation of the world around us. Remember, he left us and he just had compassion. He had compassion for the broken. But he didn't stop there. He didn't just observe it. So start back at verse 35 again. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. Are we looking at the same body of people? Disciples are probably seeing this too. They're weary. They're, they're done. But Jesus is saying, I see the harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few. He's not so much worried about the soil as he's more worried about who's going to be planting the soil. Who's going to be sowing the seed. This is his solution in verse 38. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus sees the same world, the same broken hearts, the same hurt, pain, everything that we see. And he doesn't get discouraged. He sees the reality of spiritual truths that just under the surface of all that death, all that dirt, there's a grand harvest. And it's ready to spring up. And I know there's many of us here that sees the problems in the world today. I was thinking there's many that probably have loved ones who are lost. It's hard to grasp. There's probably some sitting here right now. Maybe you feel like you've gone too far. The situations, the circumstances in your life feels like, you know, you don't understand. It is that pile of bones. There are those who are just tired of looking like Christians. Those corpses that have no breath. They're void of the breath of God because they're relying on their own self-righteousness. But they're just dead corpses laying there. Church, Jesus gives us the answer to do about all these things. First, we have to believe there is a harvest. In the midst of the worst soil, God is saying, there's a harvest underneath there. I know you don't see it, but I see it. Jesus sees through the brokenness. He sees through the bones. He sees right through death. He says we are to pray earnestly that God sends workers. You know, I was talking with Pastor Greg the other day, and there's a lot of individuals who say, will you pray for my lost loved ones? And this was a profound influence on this morning's message when he said, you know, I stopped praying for that person. And I started praying for the person who came to me and said, will you pray for so-and-so? And he says, I want to pray for you, that God equips you to take the gospel to them, that God gives you boldness to keep stepping out, that he gives you long suffering, that even though you're being persecuted and they don't like the message, that you continue to give them the message in love. That's a hard pill to swallow. Wait a minute, I'm supposed to keep doing it? That's why God has put you in that person's life. That's why he has created love for that person in your heart because you have the ability to reach them when nobody else does. Pray that he sends us. And I love it because it's out of his equals obedience to the word of God. He goes out and he prophesies. He shares the message. And God chose to bring life to his fellow countrymen. His most dearest friends who were fallen. The fact of the matter is, God doesn't have to have us. He can use an angel. He can use a still small voice. He can use a donkey in the Old Testament. And we laugh and giggle at that sometimes. But we have to realize, it's not about us at all. He made us a part of His grand redemptive plan. He invited us in. 
by taking the worst of all creation, the same creation that caused the, and is responsible for the way the shape of the world is in today. He took the same people responsible for it, forgave them, and that said, you were worthy of death. I'm going to give you life. He said, I want you to go back. That is such a gracious God who chose broken vessels to put the power of God's gospel message in for salvation. Even Paul, I know we don't rate the apostles, but he was one, probably one of the greatest apostles that we look to who reflected Christ. But he had to come to the realization of his own weakness in ministry and realize that it's only God's power that saves and transforms. He says it in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He could only be brave and boast because Jesus was with him. We can become overly overwhelmed by the work because it's not comfortable. It's not in our strength to do. I remember my first day at football career. I was in elementary school. And I remember walking up to this huge field. And it was overwhelming. The coach was scary. He wasn't a Christian coach. He was just a gruff. And Kentucky people, they take football very seriously. And then I remember I'm a large guy. So as I'm walking on the field, all the other players are like, this guy taking my position? Mm -mm. So it was not a friendly, welcoming place when I got there. And I remember the long walk from the parking lot, and I'm starting to slow down. Wait, wait a minute, where am I going? And I just remember at that moment of my most insecurity, when I was scared of what was going to happen next, this giant hand came on my back. And it was my dad. And all he said is, I'm here. I'm with you. Let's go. All that faded, and I remember the task of going out to try out for the team. What gave me comfort? It was remembering that my dad was with me. That's what Paul is saying here. It's the point of these texts. Yeah, we look at the weary, we look at the death, but don't be discouraged by our weakness because it has nothing to do with us. We have to remember that Jesus is the one working to save lives, to save your loved ones, and to pursue him because he's the one who transforms from death to life. God is with us, just like in verse 1. It goes all the way back. Who was leading Ezekiel through the bones? The Lord was leading me. That's why he had no fear. It's why he had perfect understanding because he was allowed God to lead him. So the message is today, when man, with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Do we believe that? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for these men that went before us who allow us not only just to see our faith, the unseen things, but they give us tangible evidence in history and in Scripture. And even in 1948, when you brought all this to a head, you gave us concrete evidence that you were at work when we don't know it, when we don't see it, and we don't even believe it sometimes because of the circumstances that we're in. God, I thank you for making yourself known. I thank you for putting that gracious hand on our back. And saying, don't forget, I'm right here with you. I've called you to this work, and I know it's hard. But with me, all things are possible. So God, I just pray for all of us sitting here today that we would be encouraged and exhorted to continue the work, to continue striving forward in your name. And God, let us not be tempted by those thoughts that saying we're not doing good enough or we don't have enough knowledge or, you know what, we don't have eloquent speech. Let all that fall away. And let us remember that it's you doing the work. And I thank you that you chose to use broken vessels that are weak so that you can show your ultimate strength. That's why it confounds all the wise in the world. That's why people stumble over it. They don't understand that God would reach down in such a way. And I'm so glad we don't have to reach up and work our way to you. And Lord, we just thank you for that. I just pray that you would just be glorified this week. Bless our body this week. Bring Pastor John home to us quickly. We miss him. And God, we just ask this in your name. Amen.